So we press forward. 459 then, this is what we're talking about. We just hit this. What are the means of conversion? Well, it's the gospel and then the Holy Spirit using this. And then he stresses, top of 449, 459, that there must always be the proclamation of the law preceding the gospel. So the Holy Spirit uses the Word of God, and the Word of God, we've learned about this, is divided properly into law and gospel, both things. And we'll talk about this more next time, or next quarter. And so we have the Word of God is the law and the gospel both together, and the law always comes first. And then he has this nice phrase. He talks about this on the middle of 459, the concio legis realis, which is Latin for the speech or the, um, the um, essay, kind of like more like the oral proclamation, the speech of reality's law is the concio realis legis. So in other words, the garbage that life gives you. And that's law. So when your dog dies and your cat scratches you and your wife burns your oatmeal and life is just not good, well, that's law crashing down on you. And that's just life stinks. And so that's the law of life kind of crashing in on you. And you'll experience this too. You're going to have people who come in and they're already crushed by simply living. And you don't need to pound them hit harder with law. They're already smashed down plenty. It's time to give them gospel. So law will always precede gospel, even if it's not directly proclaimed. God will get the law done. And that's the way things work here. That's what we're talking about. So law and gospel have to be done in their proper order and proper distinction. Now, the next thing that Peter talks about here are these inner motions in conversion. And he talks about this... Um, the aspects of conversion and the things that are going on. And from a Lutheran standpoint, we would say there are two parts that happen. The first thing is what the law produces, which is a terror of conscience. And he has this Latin phrase in there more than once, the terrores consciensi, which is, simply means terrors of conscience. And the law does that. The law produces terrors of conscience. That's always part one of conversion. And then what's part two of conversion? Well, trust in the gospel. Yeah, faith in the gospel. And so the terrors of conscience comes, and then the faith in the gospel follows that. So the law kills me, crushes me, terrifies me, and then the gospel comforts me, and then I believe the gospel. That's conversion. So conversion, we'd say, has two parts, the terrors of conscience and the comfort of the gospel. They go together. Now, this raises an interesting question. Anybody else struck by this when you're doing this really pedantic, obvious Redundant reading. Is anybody else struck by one of the interesting questions that comes up in this discussion about terror is consciencia? Doug? It plays a lot on our emotions. We're on the right track. Any other thoughts on about this? How many of you guys have experienced the terrors of conscience? So this is an interesting question. Like, huh, have I? Now, if you're Martin Luther, this is a slam dunk. I mean, he got to hang out in the Augustinian monastery. Terrors of conscience, they made sure of it. And so he's got his great stories of going out into the courtyard in the middle of the night, leaving his frozen cell and breaking through the frozen ice on the water and the puddles and throwing the ice cold water on his body to punish himself. Right? You know the stories. And he's just agonizing over trying to get right with God, and he can't. So is Luther experiencing the terrores conscientiae? Oh, yeah. Oh, man, he's got them. And another one of our great forebears in the LCMS is C.F.W. Walther. Did he experience this? Yes. You read his personal biography, and he went through this terrible illness where he almost died, and the brethren, the Moravian brethren, a pietistic bunch, brought him back. Very interesting. And so Walther has this nice pietistic history, which people don't like to talk about a lot, but it's there, and I believe it shows up quite a bit. So, that's CFW. Does he have his problems of conscience? Yes, he goes through it. And so now we begin to think, well, you've got to have this. And Pieper says as much, and Luther says as much. How can you be a theologian if you've never gone through this terrors of conscience? Now, I don't know about you guys, does, that, does this bother anybody? Slightly. <laughs> Why? What's the problem? Not everybody. Yeah. You see, I, I put myself into, this, into the spotlight here. I was raised in a Christian home. Not that it mattered, but my dad was a pastor, and I was a PK and grew up happily loving being a PK. Did I go through my rebellious time? No. I didn't. I didn't 
flip out in college. I didn't go through a hard time in high school. I was a good kid all the way through. Always believed in Jesus. Always knew Christ died for me. It was all cool. And I always knew it. So did I ever fall away and get saved? No. So have I ever gone through tears of conscience when I was lying awake at night thinking, I'm going to go to hell? Frankly, no. So I guess I shouldn't be a pastor. I guess I'm not really converted. You see, this is the part of the problem here. And I, and I get a little concerned when there's a little bit too much stress on this. There are some people who experience this, but not everybody does. And I think Luther would be on my side on this. Do you have to go through this emotional experience to be able to say, there, I've experienced the terrors of conscience? No. But the fact of the matter is, the law does always kill. And so even though maybe I've never gone through this emotional angst because I've fallen away and lived on the wild side for a while, and I never went through this, is there still the reality that I can think about, good grief, if it weren't for Christ, where would I be? You know, a worm ready for hell. That's reality. And so at the same time, it's kind of not quite, probably quite as pointy because I know well, Jesus is my Savior, so it's all right, and I don't have quite the, the panic that you would have without Christ. And yet, I can imagine it, and I think, honestly, it's probably enough. So for me, the terrors of conscience, basically, I think the best way to understand this is an awareness of your inability and an admission of your total inadequacy. That's really the better way to think about terrors of conscience. Not to get hung up on, did you feel it? Tell me about yours. Because now we're starting to, you know, show me yours, you know, kind of thing. And this is not helpful. And it just becomes this kind of a, a voyeuristic sort of, uh, you know, expose your, your terrors. And we don't all have that. And you don't need it, frankly. And that's what I'm kind of getting at. But what you do have to have is this recognition of, I can't save myself. I'm, in, I'm inadequate. If it was up to me, man, I would be in a pile of trouble. And that I can recognize. And that we need to recognize. Because if we don't come to terms with that, we'll never quite really come to an appreciation for what the gospel really is all about. And I agree with that. But this is part of just the life of preaching all the time. The daily dynamic of recognition of personal failure, recognition of God's grace, that's really what it's all about. So these two components come together, the terrors of conscience and faith in the gospel. And I would suggest that good Christian preaching does this on a weekly, daily basis. So you have this kind of dynamic all the time. I would terror of conscience, uh, would that also be something like when I hear evangelicals <coughs> asking, well, when did you come to Christ? Right. This is another one of those kind of difficult problems, you know, because for me it's like, well, let's see. No, let me think. I had, yeah, I had a really rough t childhood, you know, the time before without Christ. It's about 15 of the worst days of my life. And then Christ <laughs> called me. You know, it's, it's not very exciting. You know, infant baptism is not a very fun testimony. But it, it, you're right. You just well, don't. I, it's hard to point to it. I've, I've actually pointed to my baptism, or a lot of times I would say I've been a Christian my whole life, and they're like, oh, I've never heard that before. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, it's because they haven't told the story the right way, yeah. Right, exactly, exactly. So, but that is our story. Um, when I was in the Philippines once with a bunch of high school kids from my, from my Lutheran church, we were there doing some um, evangelism training. We were at a group, a church that was um, not Lutheran and were quite Arminian and believed in believers' baptism, all this kind of stuff. And so part of the routine was we the kids stand up and introduce themselves and tell a bit about themselves. So the kids got up and the first one did this and said, I was baptized as a baby and I've been a Christian my entire life and he went on to tell a story. Well, he kind of set the tone, so every kid followed that thing after that. Well, I found out later that when they were translating into the local dialect, I think it was up in the mountains, so it wasn't Tagalog, it was something else, Ifugao or something. When they were translating it, I was told later that the translator changed their story and left out the infant baptism part because he knew that was going to confuse everybody, so he just kind of skipped that part. And it's like, come on, you know, come clean, buddy. But they just, they changed it around because they didn't like that part of the story at all, and they didn't want to confuse anybody, so... This is typical. You'll encounter this all the time. Yeah. I've been here. I was asked once after I became a Christian, because I wasn't always Christian, are you saved? And my response was, well, was I saved when Jesus died on the cross? Yeah. Was I saved when I was baptized? Yes. Am I saved today as I'm standing here talking to you? Yes. Jesus saved me. Yes. You know, and I, right. And that's the way to look at it. It's this work of God all the way through. Now, we can talk about the beginnings, and Pieper talks about this on page 463, following Chemnitz, who would talk about prevenient grace, which just means about the first coming. 
the first, the first you know, lights of grace would be prevenient grace. We tend not to make a big deal about that because grace is grace is grace, but you can talk about the prevenient grace, which is the grace that brings us into the faith. But it's really the same grace of God all the way through. All right, so God is the one doing this, but man can absolutely certainly prevent his conversion, and we've talked about that before, so man has the ability to push back. All right, this also brings up one other thing that Peter talks about, which is kind of interesting, and this is helpful from a standpoint of Scripture. This is page 466. When he talks about conversion and whether or not it is intransitive or transitive. And now we're just back to basic grammar, right? Verbs, as you know, and maybe you don't, verbs in the English language are either transitive or intransitive. A transitive verb is one where the noun, the subject of the, the sentence, is doing something to a direct object. So if you have a direct object that is receiving the action of something, you have a transitive verb. So like, John hit the ball. Hit would be a transitive verb. But you can also have intransitive verbs, like um, John is tall. And in that case, is would be intransitive. Or John sat down. Well, he didn't sit something down. He just sat down himself. So these tend to be reflexive. So the intransitive are there's no direct object. There's nothing receiving the action. That would be an intransitive. So this is also helpful when it comes to talking about conversion. And Pieper says we can talk about conversion as being either transitive or intransitive. If we say that God converted this child, or God saved this sinner, or God brought him to repentance, that would be transitive. But you can also talk about I repented, I converted, I turned, and that would be intransitive. The reason we're talking about this, of course, is because the Bible talks both ways. So the Bible can say that the Holy Spirit turned to David's heart and brought him to repentance, or the Bible can say that David repented and came back to faith. We encounter much the same thing when we think about our Christology and about Christ's resurrection. We talk this way on Easter. Did Christ rise from the dead or was Christ raised from the dead? Either one works. The Father raised the Son and vindicated Him. Did the Son raise Himself? He's God. He can do that. And so the resurrection is transitive. Christ raised Himself. Or, I mean, God, the Father raised the Son, or intransitive, Christ raised himself. Same way we can talk about conversion. So, repentance, I repent. The sinner must turn, and yet God must turn him. And again, it's not an either or. It's not a which one is it, it's a both at once. And this is what Peter says the two acts, God turns, the sinner turns, are numerically one act. Exactly right. Yep, Josh. Um, isn't the uh, act of repentance, though? Uh, merely on God, and that just our own terminology does not affect that, or our own uh, grammatical... Uh, well, in fact, the Bible calls on us to turn. So now we're back to the crux tale of Gorm again, where you, have, where you have God is the one who does it all, and yet man is always responsible. And see, this sheds light on this thing I've been trying to get you guys to realize. Even justification does not negate the reality of the crux telegorum. God does it all, but man is absolutely responsible. This duality works all the way down, through justification and sanctification, both, all the way down. And that's the reason I'm trying to get you past this idea that, well, in justification, the rules are divine monergism. When we get to sanctification, now it's cooperation. No, it's not. It's always divine monergism coupled with human responsibility. God does the whole thing, and yet I'm fully responsible. Go back to justification, same thing holds. God does the whole thing, I'm responsible. So God says, turn, choose. I stand at the door and knock, open up, let me in. I've got to come in, come on, receive me. And yet, he can do nothing. God has to be the one to bring it about. And so that when God brings it about, has the person done it? Yes, by the power of the Holy Spirit. So man is responsible for what he does, but he can't do it, and then God gets full credit for doing everything, and yet man is still held accountable for what he does or doesn't do. Always. Starting to get this? Working its way in? Yes, Doug. Oh, like in our liturgy, when we say, if we confess our sins, God who is faithful and just, does that, does that pretty much highlight both aspects? In there, you bet. You're going to see this stuff all over the place, and you start watching for it and looking for it. You see it all over the place. Exactly. Drew. So does God give the human responsibility, or does the human, on his own will, act responsible? <laughs> <laughs> That's why I'll, I'll cheat and I'll go to my word accountable. 
the count, it's not a matter of giving it, it's a matter of he just has it. It's just you are, before God, a creature responsible for your choices, your actions, your, your deeds. You're responsible. And, 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 see, and that's not the equivalent of free will. That's why I'm trying to be a little bit dodgy here. It's not free will. It's not like God gave you the gift of free will. And then we're back to that stupid old discussion about, well, God risked it. He had to risk giving us free will. Nonsense. But God makes you a creature, and as a creature, you are accountable for your personal conduct, even if your conduct is not capable of doing what you're required to do. So, yeah, God gives you that responsibility by virtue of the fact that you are a creature who is resp a responsible agent for your own, for your own being. But, see, I, I'm, I'm reluctant to use words like autonomy even. You know, like you're an autonomous creature. Not really. You don't stand alone. You're not independent. But you are always responsible for what you do. And that's why I, I like the word responsibility. I like the word accountability. Free will, no. Autonomous, not so much. All right? Yep. Just out of curiosity, um, this, I, you mentioned briefly that this also works in sanctification. Yes. Um, the, the duality. The duality. Right, right. Yeah. And I, I'm just trying to think about how that would play out a little bit more, um, especially because Peeper seems to be focusing here on conversion. Oh, is Right. Talking about that. And right. Just, I mean, in my head, I can still see this playing out in the life of the Christian daily. I mean, when we talk about drowning the old Adam. That's and exactly right. And to his credit, Peeper does talk about that. In fact, it's the very next section. Daily repentance, continual conversion. He sees this as an ongoing thing. And so this is the dialectic. So the Christian is living always in this dialectic of law and gospel. The law kills, gospel makes alive. When are you done with this? Oh, come on. Every hour. Every day, continually living in this. Man, I messed up. I'm forgiven. Oh, it's awesome. It's what, you know, it's the whole picture of you just knock yourself out, striving to do the very best you can, and then you simply lay back and bask in the glory of forgiveness. It's always both. And so you have this weird manic depressive, you know, for lack of, you know, kind of going all out, and yet just simply laying back. And it's not a uh, psychosis, and it's not something kind of weird. It's just the reality. And we all know it. And any Lutheran who's living faithfully knows exactly what I'm talking about because you live it all the time. And frankly, it's a blast. It really is. It gives you purpose, gives you something to do, and gives you complete freedom. How cool is that? Can't go wrong. That's why Lutherans have the corner. We have the market cornered on real life Christian living. We do. And the, which is ironic because who gets all, who publishes all the books? The stupid evangelicals. But we've got so much more. So much more. Get busy. Start writing, people. The world likes the evangelical. Yeah, yeah, I know. Brett. Um, something that I found especially helpful in Peeper was the Ephesians 2 passage mm. Mm. Um, that I thought really very clearly in a succinct way deals with this problem. The divine monogism, God does it all, but then once the faith is there, you're the one who does the believing, and then the life of works comes popping on out. You bet. Yeah, it is. I agree. It's very clear. It's good stuff. You're quite right. All right. <clears throat> good. I had a thought and I lost it, but I guess it was not an important one. All right. Let's go on. So this continual conversion is always happening. This is just the life we live. This is the reality of this daily repentance, this killing and making alive, drowning the old Adam all the time. Reconversion. What if somebody legitimately really does fall away from the faith? Is that a possibility? Yeah. Can he come back? Hebrews 7 says he can't. Says he can't. Well, it was a Hebrews, it's somewhere in there. Hebrews 6, 7, or 8, one of those. So it's impossible for one who has seen the light for him to be converted again. Isn't that what uh, Luther didn't like about that? Yeah, Luther that? didn't like that about Hebrews very much, right? That's part of his problem. Now, and you can get around it. I mean, that's an exegetical problem. I'm not qualified to do that. I'm not an exegete. Um, <laughs> wouldn't even try. Wouldn't even try. Um, but you can get around this by saying Hebrews is expressing this stern warning, don't monkey around with grace, which is exactly the point. But, in fact, is it possible for somebody who falls away to come back to get into faith? We say, who can close the door on God's mercy? God's mercy can do all things. And yet, reality, we know, even sometimes from hard experience, is these are really difficult things. Because somebody who has tasted the light and walked away from it has been thoroughly inoculated from further work of the law and often is resistant to this. So it's not an easy thing, but we don't give up. And this leads into a discussion then also, well, we first thing we need to talk about the, the novations, novationism. Oops, I left out VA there. 
Pick it in. Novationisms, okay? You get the idea. I don't, I don't like to erase. I'll erase. I want it to look pretty. Novationism. Novations taught, and this is an old heresy, that you fall away, you're done. No repentance. You're cooked. That's it. And this leads into a discussion about the sin against the Holy Spirit. Because the sin against the Holy Spirit is the unforgivable sin. And you'll just scare people. Just talk about, well, that's a sin against the Holy Spirit, and just leave it alone. And just watch your people. Just, they'll just squirm and twist. And then finally somebody's going to raise their hand and ask. Because it really bothers them, this whole sin against the Holy Spirit. Is there a such thing as a sin against the Holy Spirit? Well, absolutely. And that's basically when you kick the Holy Spirit out and say, I don't uh, anything to do with you. Rejecting the faith. And have people committed it? Sure. How do you know? You don't. You don't. And that's why there's not much point in talking about the sin against the Holy Spirit. God knows. Presumably the person who committed it might know. Even he might not know. But here's the scary thought of this, and it's just kind of a two-sided thing. The reality is you can drive out the Holy Spirit and lose your faith, and there's actually the possibility that God could say, that's it. You're done. That opportunity I gave you to repent, that was your last one. You don't get another one. You're done. It would be comparable to Pharaoh's heart being hardened. God said, you're done. So, and this is possible. This is something we don't think about very much, but it's absolutely possible. We usually assume that until the day you die, there's a chance for you to repent. Well, in fact, maybe there's not. Maybe you have run out your course, and God has said, fine. That's how you want it. You're done. You're confirmed in your, in your, in your, in your um, rebellion. You're confirmed in your rejection. You have committed the sin against the Holy Spirit. You're done. And so that person will not be converted. That's it. He's the walking damned. Now, our ability to judge that is zero. We can't know. You can't look at somebody and say, yeah, well, Fred there, sin against the Holy Spirit, you got the big old S on your forehead, you're done. Leave him alone. Don't waste any time on evangelistic efforts on Fred. He's cooked. He's, 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 too, he's over the hill. He's done. We don't know that. In fact, we never know where anybody stands. So our responsibility is always to bring, bring the Word of God, law and gospel, as sternly and as ardently as we possibly can, whenever we can, because that's what we are here to do. Whether or not the person has committed the sins to the Holy Spirit, we don't know. They might have, but we don't know. So from the perspective of the evangelist, it's irrelevant. You go all out. And by the way, this should be a word of stern warning. You never, ever write somebody off and say they're too far gone. That's not your call. You don't get to decide. You don't get to decide in your parish when this shut-in or when this um, delinquent member is not worth the effort anymore. You don't get to make that call. Your job is simply to bring the truth every time you can to anybody you can. That's your job. Don't make decisions about who's worthy and who's not. And you'll be shocked sometimes about the people who actually do get around to repenting and when they do it. So never, never give up. On the other hand, so that's the one side of the story. But let's not forget the other side of the story. The other side of the story is, is it possible that God would say, this is it, your last chance, this is the last appeal? Yeah. yeah. And so what does that mean about how we should handle the Spirit's work in our own life? You don't monkey around with them. You don't play games. You don't say, eh, I'll get around to repenting later. You might not get around to it. You might not be given the chance. And that's why St. Paul says, today is the day of salvation. You don't mess around. You receive the Spirit's gifts when he's being offered, and you don't postpone, because postponing is serious, deadly business. We'll talk about this more next quarter when we read Caberly, who um, does an outstanding job presenting these truths. All right, <coughs> so we got that covered there pretty well. Um, last thing on this section. Yep, go ahead. Uh, maybe you'll still get there. Is the David thing in this section? Go ahead. This is not time for it. Um, we, that comes up a lot um, as to Luther seeing David as falling from the faith. That's right. Um, yeah, he, well, it's actually in confession, so you can't dodge it. It's in the small called articles. Okay, I know that too. <laughs> yeah, um, I know you do. Sure can you just, um, <laughs> can you enlighten me as to where that understanding comes from scripturally? Because I don't um, always see it as. I don't know that it does. Okay. Because it's almost like Luther's doing what we're not supposed to be doing. Well, I, he kind of is. And this bothers some people. I, I don't let it bother me much anymore. I just, you know, Luther said it. What's your problem? <laughs> Come on. 
<laughs> now, so um, David's one thing, and I can probably live with David. And David was a, what, what an idiot. I mean, you know, Bathsheba, Uriah, covered up, yeah. live on it. Come on, come on. Peter is a little more tough. Because yeah. David, because Luther throws Peter in that category. Right. Yeah. yeah. So Luther says that when Peter denies his Lord, he doesn't just simply really mess up. He loses his faith and must be converted again. It's pretty strong language. Now, is Luther going beyond what Scripture says? Yes. Is Luther, you know, drawing some conclusions which maybe he shouldn't have made? Maybe. But it's in the Confessions, so we will be happy with that. Okay? And it can live with it. But I think Luther's point is, hey, this is reality what's going on. And he also points to the fact that how he was treated how Nathan handled it, and how Christ handled it. The whole, the reinstatement of Peter is more than simply, I forgive you. It's a little more like, you're back in. And even that threefold reinstatement that you have, you know, in John 20, it's pretty significant. And so I think Luther's got some, some argument exegetically on his side, even though there's never a text that says, and the Holy Spirit departed from Peter. You know, we're not told that, that cleanly. But, boy, the indications sure are there. And again, this is one of those things that most of our parishioners have no clue about. They've never heard that Peter lost his faith. They know Peter really messed up, and that's kind of a drag. But lost his faith? Whoa! And that's one of the things I think we need to tell people. Yeah, lost his faith. That happens. You don't mess around. Yeah, this is, that's, that's what I'm, one of my kind of recurrent points. How often do you hear that in the, in, the, in the worship service? How often do you hear people warning you, don't mess around with sin? Like that. Not usually very often. Go ahead. You want to follow up? No, that was pretty much it. All right. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure there's something else there okay. we'll just carry Bring it up as it comes. Joel. Well, I think it goes as far as to say that any time we essentially premeditatively... That's right. Premeditated sin, sin drives out yeah. the spirit. Right. Right. spirit. Which is really <laughs> confounding. Because when you start to think about it, when do I not think about my sin? And this gets really unnerving. Which is not bad. And now, see, this is, this is always this two-pronged sword. Because on one hand... Boy, maybe I should stop and think twice about my sin before I start indulging. You know, before I just kind of, you know, let my eyes wander or, you know, do a few things that are no big deal. I'll just repent later. No, wait a minute. If I'm deliberately choosing what I know is opposed to God's will, that's willful sin. That drives out the spirit. The spirit can't live with that. And at the same time, we don't want people living in abject terror and despair. Oh, man, I just lost my faith again. You know, we don't want this. But there's this kind of, there's this tension. On the one hand, Take sin really seriously. On the other hand, don't despair of God's love for you. Both have to be there. And that's, we're back to kind of that law gospel message. Which one do you need? And I'm willing to say, I think more of the time than we realize, the law needs to be delivered. Stop doing that, you idiot. It's going to kill you. But we'll talk about that more next quarter, too. I can't wait. All right? Tim. For fear of going where I don't want to go, and don't go. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, if Luther is saying that with Peter there was a reconversion, mm -hmm. then wouldn't it be within our teaching and in our thought to say that reconversion can happen? Well, sure. We say it can happen. Absolutely. We believe that. We're not even after that. the sin of the against. The well, Lord. obviously, Peter didn't commit the sin against the Holy Spirit. So he, because the sin against the Holy Spirit is a damning sin. That's it. You're done. And my point is, the sin against the Holy Spirit can happen, but we never know when it happens. It's only in retrospect we can look back and say, well, yeah, that guy committed the sin against the Holy Spirit. He, he died in his faith, and he's, he's lost. But, so Peter committed a grievous sin, rejected his Lord, denied his Lord, and yet because he was converted, uh, mercifully he didn't commit the sin against the Holy Spirit. Same with David. I'm glad you asked. That needs to be clarified. Quickly, Josh. Uh, have you heard of these YouTube videos where people... I've heard uh, of YouTube videos. <laughs> <laughs> Believe it or not, I've heard of them, yes. <laughs> I've even watched a couple. But not many. I'm sorry, Josh. I'm playing with you. That was very naughty of me. Go ahead. <laughs> Which ones did you have in mind in particular? Uh, they're kind of these atheistic, satirical uh, ones where people go on and blaspheme the oh, Spirit. Oh, oh, oh. There's actually a, you can blaspheme the Holy Spirit. It's like a website you can do this on. And you can like sign up and do it and be recorded doing it. It's just it's a really hip thing to do. Yeah, I've heard of that. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of a scary thing when you think about it. Mercifully, even that, God will, probably doesn't take as seriously as they do, which is a good thing. Yeah. Um, 
My question is on this idea of state of grace and leading the state of grace. Because don't the confessions also speak yeah. about willful sin as not leading the state of grace? Um, Walter, see, I know this is it. This is that whole tension thing. And if you want to explore this further, take theological ethics someday, or you can just talk to Sarah and she'll fill you in. Okay. <laughs> we there was a lot of discussion um, <laughs> as we read Law and Gospel about this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Well, that's because Walton takes sin pretty seriously, too. It's yeah. shocking to most people. <laughs> Well, no, I'm serious, because everybody, everybody, when it comes to long gospel, they know one thesis, the last one, thesis 20. The general predominance of the gospel should characterize our preaching. Oh, good. Gospel has to predominate. And that's the one thing they remember. They forget about everything else where Walter says, hey, take sin seriously. Don't make soft pillows for your hearers, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So Walter, yeah, he takes sin pretty seriously, doesn't he? Yeah. He seems to act like it matters. Well, it does. If, really? <laughs> I would agree. Yeah. All right, let's move forward here. We've got some more ground to cover. Last page um, on this section, page 470, Peeper reminds us of how different our view of two steps, terror of conscience, gospel delivered, done. That's conversion. Rome says three steps, and it's rather nice in the Latin. So you have to have a contritio cordis, which is a contrite heart. You have to have the confessio Oris, which is the confession of the mouth. We get our word oral from that, as you could probably guess. And then you have to have the satisfactio, satisfactio operis, which is the satisfaction of works. So these are the three things you've got to have. So you have to have a contrite heart where you really feel bad. You have to go and make verbal confession to the priest in confession, and then when he gives you your penance to do, you got to go and do it. When you get your penance done, now you're forgiven, but not until. And this is what Rome calls the second plank. So if you're sailing to salvation on the good ship baptism, and then you really mess up, and the ship goes down, well, you're sunk, literally. But wait! In his mercy, God kicks a 2 by 4 your direction. Or no, we'll make it a 2 by 12 We'll give it a little better. He kicks a 2 by 12 your direction, and you grab on. Or there's an old hogshead barrel, and you grab on. And now on this piece of flotsam, that's your second plank. And now you can make your way to salvation, kind of kicking your way. It's a little work, but you can get there. That's the second plank, because baptism only covers sins up to baptism. That's how it works in Rome, which is why in the Middle Ages, they had this great thing. Well, just wait and get baptized at the end. You don't have to worry about it, which is cool if you know when you're going to die. But if death gets you unawares, you're in trouble. So that's kind of a, kind of a gamble. But this is the second plank. Um, Lutheranism says nonsense. You return to your baptism, and you're reinstated in your baptism, and the re reality of your baptism is yours for sure. And we'll talk about this more when we do baptism in means of grace next quarter. But this is the Romans' second plank, and you see how very different this is than simply God crushes you, God gives you faith. Here, it's all about your performance, which is why it has that semi-Pelagian flavor to it, to the max. Jacob. Josh. Yes. The last two, uh, confession. Is the second one confession? Yes, okay. confession of the mouth. And then the last one was that? Satisfaction of works. Okay, okay. In other words, do the deed, do the penance. So if the, if the priest says 12 Hail Marys and $2,000 in the building fund, thank you very much. Okay, so you do it, and then you're done. Everything's all good. And again, oh, this is a great money making. It could be, not that it has to be. The first is baptism, the second is. The first one is contritio or cordis, which is the contrition of the heart. And then confessio oris, which is the confession of the mouth. And then satisfactio operis, which is the satisfaction of works or deeds. All right, now we skip all those intervening pages. We already hit the one highlight there from the Melanchthon stuff. Page 498, we're wrapping this up. And this is not much to say here. These are the synonyms of conversion and things like um, regeneration, to be born again, page 499. Things like quickening or resurrection, illumination, awakening, calling, repentance. These are all synonyms for this work of God calling you to faith, and they're all good. Scripture uses them all. That's it. Anything else? Volume 2. All right, volume three it is again. And here we're hitting pages 89 to 100. And the reason is because this is where Pieper deals with the doctrine of perseverance of the saints. So do Lutherans believe in the perseverance of the saints? Yes. 
Yes. Yeah, Pieper says it's of the utmost importance. And again, this is one of those shockers because most of us have learned, hey, TULIP stands for Calvinism, right? TULIP Calvinism, five-point TULIP Calvinism. You know what I'm talking about here? Five-point TULIP Calvinism, total depravity, unconditional grace, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and perseverance of the saints, unconditional um, call, okay? And so this would be TULIP Calvinism. And so the P is perseverance of the saints. We're not Calvinists. We must not believe in perseverance of the saints because perseverance of the saints is translated into the acronym, once saved, always saved, or an aphorism, not acronym. All right, so the nice aphorism, once saved, always saved, we don't believe in that. And so we don't believe perseverance of the saints. But wait, we do. Just like we also believe in total depravity, we do. The other one's some issues. But um, we do believe in total depravity, and we do believe in perseverance of the saints. Because what's perseverance of the saints saying? God will see you through. Once God calls you and chooses you and graces you, is he going to change his mind about you? No. God never changes his mind about you. However, you have that stupid thing called a recalcitrant, stubborn spirit. Can you walk away from the grace God extends? Yes. And so this is how you think about it. And the analogy kind of works here. So God holds us in his hand. Will he ever let you go? No. Never. Will he ever shake you a little bit to see what happens? No, God won't. Satan might mess around and shake you a little bit. God doesn't play games. He doesn't do that. However, can you crawl up to the edge and jump out? Yes. yes. And so he'll be there holding an offering, and you're just walking away. Now all the analogies start to come into play here. The parable of the prodigal son comes to mind. So the son walks away, goes to a far country. Is he still the, spot, the son of the father? Is the father still loving him, waiting for him, offering him grace, and holding out that offer? Sure. Even when the son is walking away and not receiving it, it's still there. This analogy works rather well with baptism. So why we don't practice rebaptism. When God baptizes you, he calls you and he claims you, he does it right. If you walk away from the benefits, you don't receive the benefits, but they're still there and even yours if you would simply have the sense to receive them and benefit of them. Like a check that I leave in a drawer. That's right, like a check you leave in the drawer. It's there and it's really yours even though you don't get any of the benefit. And so then, back to our baptism analogy, when a person does come to his senses and say, I've walked away from God. I need to go find him. So he turns around to look for God, and where is he? Exactly. Here I am. I've never left. Come on, idiot. Get back where you belong and receive the gifts. And so you simply reappropriate then the benefits, and you return to the baptism that was always there for you. You don't need to do it over again because God didn't mess it up. And see, this is, this is the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints. God makes his claim. He's made his claim. He's not going to change his mind about you. The, and the only reason he'll ever do anything different is when you simply refuse, then he reluctantly says, all right, this is what you want, then you've got what you'll get. Hell is your choice. And that's why it's been said, and I believe accurately, that hell is something that you choose for yourself. God doesn't send you there as much as you choose it, which sounds really weird because who would choose hell? But that's exactly what people do. I don't want God. I'll do my own thing. You're choosing hell. That's the reality. So we do absolutely believe in perseverance of the saints, but then what comes through here very nicely, at, this is page 89, two parts. First paragraph, halfway through. He that perseveres in faith does so only through God's gracious preservation. The believer's perseverance is a work of divine grace and omnipotence. This is part two. He that falls from faith does so through his own fault. There we have it. Sounds like Crux Telegorum again, doesn't it? And that's exactly the point. So the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints is the crux telegorum one more time. God will certainly see you through. You can certainly mess it up. So we're saved sola gratia, and we're condemned sola culpa hominis. Sola, my own fault, by, by my own fault. And that's the reality of this clearly coming through here. And that's exactly what we teach. So we do believe in the perseverance of the saints, and it's God who is the one who sees us through this. He's the one who makes it happen. All right, good. Um, synergistic doctrines come into play here where we have to kind of work us out. That's what Major was trying to say. Hey, if good works 
Um, if the lack of good works will condemn you, and you've got to be producing good works to sustain your faith, that means good works are necessary. No, we don't say that, because God is the one who does it all. So divine monergism runs the show here as well, and yet still does, along with that, is our responsibility. Um, <clears throat> so that he's discussing that page 92, this whole um, problem of majorism, and the problems of this kind of cooperative effort, where that leads you. Page 93, then, um, Luther has this very nice thing, um, He's talking about Peter. Um, only a few hours later, Peter cursed and swore that he did not know the Lord Jesus. Luther calls this attitude of unwillingness to depend solely on God's grace for salvation the vicious, insidious deception, which still stirs in the flesh of the Christians and must be suppressed constantly and mercilessly if the first are not to become the last. Against this insidious deception, Paul is warning the Philippians when admonishing them to work out their salvation with fear and trembling. He tells them that it is God who works in them both to will and do of his good pleasure. And so Philippians 2 gets this just beautifully. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Human responsibility, you better do it. But it is God who is at work in you. Divine monergism all the way through, God does it. So the sinner can be absolutely assured, I'm God's child. He won't let me go. And God, don't let me go because I'll mess it up. But yet, at the same time, watch myself be careful. Luther's sacristy prayer comes to mind. You guys familiar with that? You know, Lord, you made me a pastor in your church. You know how incapable I am. And if left to myself, I surely bring it all to a mess immediately. So be with me. Help me. And so it's exactly it's that same dynamic. If it's something good happening, it's the Holy Spirit working in and through me. If it's something that is making a mess of it, that's my mess. That's my fault. It's always this dynamic. Yep. Brett. He talks about Peter here. Yes, he does. And it makes it sound like he hasn't left the state of grace here. Luther doesn't always keep the same opinions all the way through. And whether he was actually saying that here or not, I don't know. But, yeah, Luther would, well, he, he, felt, he felt free to change his mind when he needed to. <laughs> okay. <laughs> just, I mean, context. that just crossed my mind. I'm like, ah, no, look at that you, again. You can find worse things in Luther. He'll, he'll say two things at once pretty freely, yeah. All depends on what needs to be said. A little bit like preaching. All right. Peeper then on page 94 says a pretty shocking thing. Um, that fat paragraph on 94, second sentence in, the caution is superfluous because, this is against the Roman Catholics, there can be no assurance of salvation if salvation depends on man himself. That's right. And so how can you give anybody assurance of salvation? But then he goes on, and he, this is really interesting. The person who holds, not merely at his desk and in his polemics, but in his heart, and before God, that his salvation rests not exclusively with his gracious God, but depends also on his conduct, has lost his faith. Wow. So what Peeper has said, that it's one thing to argue about synergism. It's one thing to argue that you need to do good works. And it's one thing to make this a polemical issue in your writing. But if you actually believe it in your heart, if you actually believe a synergistic position in your faith, you don't have faith because you're not trusting in Christ alone and you've lost your salvation. That's pretty strong language. And he's right, though. And so this is why he can say that when it comes right down to it, everybody ultimately is a Lutheran in their confession because they're trusting Christ alone for their salvation. Because if you're not, you're not saved. You're not a Christian. And he's right about that. It's pretty strong language, but he's, he's right on the money. All right, good. Um, yeah, okay, come for the gospel, cover that, the merits are out, good. Obviously, again, we're back to the crux one more time. He has this Latin phrase I gave it to you before, but he has it in writing here for you on page 98. So we recognize the crux telegorum always gives us two things. One is that we're saved, sola gratia, and yet at the same time, we recognize that if there's a problem or things get wrong, that is sola culpa homine. So, sola gratia, only by grace, but if we mess up, it's only the human, the fault of the human. So, only my fault. Culpa just means fault or blame or culpability, okay? So, who's to blame? Me. So, this is always the twofold reality of the crux telegorum. Saved purely by grace, divine monergism, God does it all, and yet, human responsibility, I'm always accountable for what I do or don't do, and when I, things go wrong, it's my fault, period. My fault, my own fault, my own most grievous fault. <clears throat> okay, 
Finally then, page 100, two more points need to be noted. Peter says, first of all, the realization of the truth of Romans 7, that utter despair of our own strength will impel us to diligent use of God's word or the means through which God will complete us, the good work in us. So when you realize your own shortcomings and failure, you want to be where God's delivering His grace. And then the second thing is, the realization of the truth that our salvation is entirely in God's hand will drive us humbly to petition and implore God for His gracious help. So we want God to never let us go. And this is, this is the kind of the cool dynamic. So when you're actually living this full human responsibility seriously, you're always going to end up falling short and being driven to the need for forgiveness, and then you get it. And so it it's, pushes you right smack back into the delivery of the means of grace, right smack into the gospel, and they don't work in antithetical against each other, but they work in beautiful concert together. And that brings us to the end. Final questions you've got about anything, odds and ends, loose ends from today or before, anything before the test, or anything you're just wanting to ask about. Yes? One of the things, and I just... I don't know, I guess I struggle with it because I have family members in other denominations. Uh -huh. uh, it's what we were talking about towards the end about people saying if you truly believe that it's synergistic, you don't really believe, right? Lots of denominations teach that, but I don't really know how many people actually believe that. Correct. Because even when they talk, they're hesitant. That's right. So I, I guess I'm, I'm looking for a comfort on my own. Yeah, part. I know you That's, are. This is where we get into that whole thing on the felicitous inconsistencies, where people aren't even following their own teachings faithfully, and that's a good thing. Um, Pieper talks about this quite a bit. He's actually very interested in this. It comes up frequently in his, in his writing, his, his volumes, where he talks about even um, you know, hardline, heterodox liberals who are really annoying to him, who the stories are that on their deathbed they repented and you know, asked for forgiveness and sought purely Christ's forgiveness. And so Pieper has kind of the attitude that you know, when push comes to shove, people know the real deal, and they know that it's only in Christ, and they know that. And they might, in their polemics, and they might, in their, um, you know, writing or their teaching, say otherwise, but when it comes right down to it, they know where they stand, because the law doesn't let them get away with it. And so, Peeper's kind of, I mean, actually, surprisingly, a little hopeful there, but does that excuse you for your bad teaching? No. But as far as the existential reality, where they stand, yeah, Peeper was willing to say, yeah, most people recognize the reality when it comes right down to it. I think he's probably right about that, assuming they have some semblance of Christian faith. All right? Good. Anything else? All right. We'll see you on Friday upstairs. Have a great rest of the week, gang.